Hi everyone and welcome back to Minds and Machines with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. Now today we're going to be looking at one of my favorite areas of interest, and that is of course the work of Alan Turing. We're going to be looking specifically at two important ideas that we owe to Turing, and which are now named after Turing. One of those is the idea of the Turing machine, which I already talked briefly about in my lecture, What is the Mind? That was lecture 1.2. I'll put a card up here for anyone who's interested who hasn't seen it yet. We'll also be talking about the Turing test, or as Alan Turing called it, the imitation game. And as I said, uh, this is one of my favorite topics to discuss. Both of these are among my favorite topics to discuss, Turing machines and the Turing test. When I was an undergraduate, I read this paper in, I believe, my fourth year of study. But lucky you, you get to read it in this first year class. And it's going to be fun. So before we take a look at Turing machines and the Turing test, let's talk a little bit about Alan Turing himself. Some of the philosophers that we've looked at in this class so far have lived um, interesting yet short lives. Turing is certainly one of these. Um, Turing was born in London uh, in the year 1912, and he would go on to study uh, mathematics at Cambridge University. Uh, Turing, during his life, was known primarily as a mathematician, a cryptographer, and a bit of a philosopher as well. Nowadays, we tend to think of him as the father of artificial intelligence, um, at least the theoretical uh, father of theoretical artificial intelligence, as well as one of the initiators of computer science. But, as I mentioned, he studied mathematics at Cambridge University and uh, began to develop some very important ideas, ideas that will turn out to be very important during this time. For example, in a paper uh, presented to the London Mathematical Society called On Computable Numbers, uh, Turing um, presents an interesting take on the halting problem or decision problem. Uh, we'll talk about the decision problem a bit later, but this is where he introduced a mathematical model which would come to be known as a Turing machine. We talked a little bit about Turing machines in lecture 1.2, what is the mind? And I'll talk a little bit more about Turing machines later on in this lecture. Anyway, after completing his undergraduate studies, Alan Turing would uh, hop across the pond, as it were, to America, and he would pursue a doctorate in mathematics under the supervision of Alonzo Church. Of course, the Church-Turing thesis is named after these two. Um, the Church-Turing thesis basically says that um, Anything that can be expressed algorithmically uh, as, you know, as a, like a, in a set of uh, definite and circumscribed rules uh, can be solved by a Turing machine or uh, anything that can be expressed algorithmically is computable. And there is a kind of Turing machine called a universal Turing machine uh, that can compute these algorithms, basically. Um, he almost stuck around Princeton after he graduated. He was, um, he was asked by John Ma von Neumann, I believe, another early initiator of computer science, uh, to be his postdoctoral assistant. But he ended up going back to the United Kingdom. Turing is, of course, very well known for his work as a cryptographer at Bletchley Park during the Second World War. Um, Bletchley Park was part of Project Ultra. Project Ultra was the British intelligence, uh, uh, wartime intelligence operation. What Project Ultra was all about was trying to intercept German communications during the war and decipher them. Now, this was difficult to do because the Germans used a device which the Allies called the Enigma machine. The Enigma machine basically had all these rotors and wheels inside uh, such that the machine could be set, the ciphers of the machine could be set in millions upon millions of different ways. Um, it was very difficult to work out the settings for the Enigma machine. And of course, you had to know the settings of the machine in order to decrypt messages. Now, the Nazis updated uh, the settings for the machines very regularly, right? Uh, so every, say, every week or so, um, everyone 
would have to change the settings on their machine uh, so that if the allies were intercepting messages and they got the settings for the machine, then a short time later, they would not be able to decrypt the, the messages again, right? So the Nazis had this Enigma machine that they were sending messages with, and the Allies were trying to crack these codes, uh, trying to crack the settings of the Enigma machine. They had uh, schematics for the Enigma machine and some uh, prototypes of the Enigma machine as well, which had been smuggled to England from Poland when Poland was invaded by the Nazis and the Soviet Union. Um, so they had the settings, uh, but it was hard to work out, because there were so many settings, which setting you had to have the machine on to decrypt a message. This is what the Allies were kind of struggling to do. Turing came along and said, I can build computers that can help determine the settings of the Enigma machine. And with this computer, these computers were called uh, BOMBs, basically, B-O-M-B-E. So he would build these digital computers that could figure out, uh, based upon the messages that they were receiving, the settings of the Enigma machine, which would allow the Allies to decrypt the messages that the Nazis were sending to one another. So this allowed the Allies to gather um, a uh, significant amount of information, and some historians estimate that Turing's contributions to the war effort as a cryptographer might have shortened the Second World War by about two years and may have saved up to 14 million lives. So Turing's work was incredibly important here, but it was not known the full extent of his contributions until years later, because of course all of this work was highly classified, even after the war. After the war, Turing um, uh, continued to work on computers, computer science, and artificial intelligence. In the paper we're going to look at today, for example, he explores the question of whether machines can be said to think. And of course, he does that with his imitation game, or as it has come to be known, the Turing test. You know, there's a saying among World War II history buffs, and that is that uh, the Second World War was won by American weapons, British intelligence, and Soviet blood. What that means, of course, is that's um, a reference to the Americans, the Lend-Lease Act. The Americans would send uh, war machinery to Britain before they officially joined the Second World War, that is. Um, the Soviet Union simply had so much manpower that they could afford, well, that's not really a good way to say it. It's not like we can afford to waste human life, but there were a lot of Soviet soldiers. A lot of soldiers fell in that war, especially Soviet uh, soldiers. And of course, British intelligence, um, largely thanks to people like Turing. But for all of Turing's contributions, it's very sad the way um, the rest of his life went uh, following the war. It was... Um, yeah, I think um, a massive injustice what ended up happening to Alan Turing, um, especially given um, his contributions to the war effort. This man, frankly, was a hero. But in 1952, he was charged with gross indecency, the same charge that was brought against Oscar Wilde many years earlier, after his house was burgled by one Arnold Murray, Arnold Murray and Alan Turing had entered into a relationship with one another. You see, Alan Turing was a gay man at a time when it was still technically against the law to be gay. Now, um, when the police found out about this, he was charged with gross indecency. Um, of course, they found out about this while uh, investigating this burglary, right? Because he had known the burglar. The burglar was his former lover, Arnold Murray. The police found out uh, that he's a homosexual. He is charged. Uh, he doesn't contest the charge, um, but he's given the choice between prison and basically hormone replacement therapy. Um, this, would, this amounted to basically taking um, a synthetic form of estrogen, uh, and the idea here was to chemically castrate or to decrease libido, right? 
So basically, Alan Turing chose this hormone therapy, this estrogen therapy. Um, and the effects of this were not pleasant. Uh, you know, Turing, uh, because of this estrogen uh, that was going through his system, uh, became impotent. Uh, he actually started developing breast tissue. Um, he became a very, very different person after this. And in 1954, at the age of only 41, Alan Turing was found dead uh, by his housekeeper. He had apparently committed suicide by ingesting an apple that had been laced with cyanide. Now, some historians think that the case for suicide is dubious. And there are, of course, conspiracy theories that uh, perhaps Alan Turing was uh, murdered by the Secret Service or something. I don't put much stock in those. Um, I think the suicide option is quite plausible. I also think it's quite plausible that um, uh, the cyanide poisoning was accidental. Uh, Turing had uh, chemicals and whatnot, including potassium cyanide in his home, uh, which he used as part of his work. Uh, and it's possible that he was accidentally exposed to a lethal amount of cyanide, so we don't know. But uh, some justice did come for Turing, uh, albeit a long, long time after his death. Sixty years later, in fact, uh, in 2014, Queen Elizabeth would officially announce a pardon, a posthumous pardon, for Alan Turing. And presently, um, in the United Kingdom, specifically in England and Wales, uh, there is the Alan Turing Law. This is a law named in Turing's honor, of course. It's a civil statute that retroactively pardons um, men in England and Wales who had previously been criminally convicted for homosexual acts. So, um, you know, it's great that that happened. I think it's so sad that um, Turing was treated the way he was by the establishment in, in his own lifetime, however. A huge injustice against uh, him and other members of the LGBTQ community as well. So, um, yeah, this, this is kind of one of those moments when I get, I get a little bit of the feels, you know? I mean, I, uh, this, this, this man was a hero, and look how he was treated. Um, simply for the way he was. Um, not very just, if you ask me. It, 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 it hurts to think about, I think. But of course, um, computers are ubiquitous these days. Um, the device I'm recording this on, my cell phone, is a universal Turing machine, if the church, uh, church Turing thesis is correct. This laptop, universal Turing machine. Um, all of the computers that we depend on uh, in our lives today are universal Turing machines. Turing laid the theoretical groundwork for all of that. Uh, I, I think it's very, very accurate to say that many people still do not appreciate just how significant Turing's work was. Um, but hopefully after today's lecture, uh, you'll have a bit more of an appreciation for its significance. So, with that said, let's begin taking a look at his paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, and we'll start by talking about the imitation game. All right, let's get started. One of the questions that has probably struck you uh, at some point in this class is the question, can machines think? Uh, that's certainly a question that I would ruminate on a lot when I was an undergraduate, thinking about things like computers and robots and all of that fun stuff that I was into back then, and which I'm still very much interested in today. Turing, however, thought that this was a silly question. Can machines think? This is uh, too meaningless to deserve discussion, according to Turing. That's from page 442 of his paper. That's because we would have to define um, machine, and we would have to define think. And uh, we would either have to resort to something silly like a survey or a Gallup poll, or we'd spend our time en engaged in endless philosophical debate trying to define what a machine is and what thinking is before we can answer the question. So Turing actually says, let's forget about this question, can machines think? Let's replace it with a different kind of question. And that question is, could a machine 
play the imitation game. Now, what is the imitation game, you ask? Well, the imitation game, uh, nowadays known as the Turing test, although in my PhD thesis I did argue that Turing tests are importantly similar yet distinct from the imitation game, in case you were wondering, um, the imitation game, or the Turing test, is an operationalist test of intelligence. So, what is operationalism? We've got to get that out of the way before we can really appreciate Turing's test. Operationalism is when we try and make something that's not directly measurable, um, measurable somehow, by focusing on something that we can measure, that we all agree is related to that unmeasurable thing that we're trying to measure. In this case, we're talking about thought. How do we measure thought? Well, I don't know, but however we measure it, it seems strange to think that we could measure it directly. So, let's measure something else, Turing says. Let's measure something that we all agree thinking things can do. Let's measure their verbal behavior, their speaking, their ability to communicate their thoughts to others with language. Can machines do that? If they can, maybe we can say they think. So, the imitation game, basically, is an operationalist test of intelligence. What does it measure? Not intelligence or thinking directly, but verbal behavior. That's how we operationalize our measurement of thinking or of intelligence. We can't directly measure intelligence, so we look at verbal behavior. We do the same thing with, uh, for example, IQ tests. I mean, we don't directly measure someone's intelligence. One's IQ score is merely a score indicating one's performance on a series of different tasks, right? Uh, mathematical tasks, visual spatial tasks, verbal tasks. It's a similar kind of thing. We're operationalizing intelligence. We don't look directly at intelligence. We look at people's abilities, or in this case, machines' abilities, uh, to do something that we all agree something with intelligence can do. Have a conversation or solve a problem, right? So the Turing test or the imitation game is pretty much an operationalist test of intelligence that focuses on verbal behavior. Now, how does the imitation game work? Well, Turing envisions three players in this paper. Uh, we have a man, a woman, and an interrogator. We'll call them A, B, and C. So A is the man, B is the woman, and C is the interrogator. It's C's job to ask A and B questions, and C's goal is to identify which is the man and which is the woman. Is A the man or is B the man? right? The machine or the person, the, the human being in this case, C, um, has to determine this. But C cannot hear or see A or B. That, that, that's because, you know, if, uh, if the interrogator could see the man and the woman, then the interrogator would instantly know which is the man and the woman. Uh, rather, um, players A and B are supposed to answer questions via, you know, like a typewritten message. C is also supposed to ask questions uh, the same way, with a typewritten message. Now, A's job is to try and fool the interrogator into making the wrong guess. So, A might give misleading answers to that effect, right? So, A is trying to convince the interrogator that he's uh, the woman and not the man. So, if I ask what A looks like, perhaps he'd describe himself with... Um, you know, a more feminine haircut rather than uh, a shorter, more masculine haircut, right? Um, now, B is supposed to help C, so she is supposed to answer honestly, um, whereas A is trying to deceive C. So, can C make the right guess? Can C correctly determine which is the man and which is the woman? That's the imitation game. As a replacement for uh, his original question, can machines think, Turing says, instead of asking, you know, can machines think, because that's, that's a silly question, why don't we just ask, what will happen when a machine takes the place of A in this game? So, instead of two humans, A and B, and a human interrogator, 
Now we have one machine and one human and an interrogator. And if the machine, uh, or rather if, if the interrogator, which is a, a human, cannot tell the difference between A and B, between the human and the machine, then that machine has won the imitation game. It's passed the Turing test. Now, in Turing's later writings, he kind of simplifies things a bit. Um, you know, uh, subsequent to computing machinery and intelligence, you know, in other publications and other interviews and stuff like that, he imagines only two players. Uh, there's one interrogator and one um, person or machine who's being interrogated. And uh, the interrogator has to ask the player questions in a kind of uh, viva voce sort of style. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. Um, now here, since we only have an interrogator and an interrogatee, um, if the interrogator can't tell whether that player is a machine or a human, uh, then the test is passed, right? Uh, by the person being interrogated, I mean. This later formulation, where there's only two players, is what we usually think of nowadays when we think of the Turing test. Now, there's actually a couple of different ways that um, Turing talks about his tests. One way is as a kind of thought experiment. And uh, no, just in case you're not sure about this, thought experiments are imaginary exercises or hypothetical scenarios that, are, that we think about in order to help us delineate our intuitions about something, right? So in some places in this paper, Turing is talking about his test as if it were a thought experiment, right? He says, for example, on page 442, are there imaginable digital computers which would do well in the imitation game, right? So he's not asking, could this computer or that computer pass the Turing test here? He's saying, is it conceivable that a digital computer suitably programmed could play the imitation game well? So he's kind of treating it as if it's a thought experiment here. Um, but elsewhere, he discusses his test as, you know, an actual empirical test. For example, he says on the same page, in about 50 years time, it will be possible to program computers with a storage capacity of about 10 to the 9th power to make them play the imitation game so well that an average interrogator will not have more than 70% chance of making the right identification after five minutes of questioning. So here he's talking about actual, you know, possible machines that we could one day build that will pass the test. So here he's saying like, you know, we could, we could use it as um, an operationalist test to see whether this machine can think or whether that machine can think. So he, he talks about it in both ways, as a thought experiment and as an empirical experiment. So that's very interesting. Now, I just want to draw your attention here to uh, some similarities between what uh, Turing writes in Computing Machinery and Intelligence and what Descartes wrote in the Discourses on the Method. Descartes writes, if there were machines bearing the images of our bodies and capable of imitating our actions as far as it is morally possible, there would still remain two most certain tests whereby to know that they were not therefore really men. Of these, the first is that they could never use words or other signs arranged in such a manner as is competent to us in order to declare our thoughts to others. For we may easily conceive a machine to be so constructed that it, it, that it emits vocables, and even that it emits some correspondent to the action upon it of external objects which cause a change in its organs. For example, if touched in a particular place, it uh, may demand uh, what we wish to say to it. If in another, it may cry out that it is hurt, and such like. But not that it should arrange them uh, variously so, uh, uh, so as appositely to reply to what is said in its presence, as men of the lowest grade of intellect can do. Ooh, long sentence. The second test, to continue, that although such machines might execute many things with equal or perhaps greater perfection than any of us, they would, without doubt, fail in certain others from which it could be discovered that they did not act from knowledge, but solely from the disposition of their organs. 
For while reason is a universal instrument that is, a, that is alike available on every occasion, these organs, on the contrary, need a particular arrangement for each particular action, whence it must be morally impossible that there should exist in any machine a diversity of organs sufficient to enable it to act in all the occurrences of life, in the way in which our reason enables us to act. So there's a couple similarities and a couple differences here. Um, one similarity is that Turing and Descartes both agree that things with minds can declare their thoughts to others uh, using language. Descartes thinks that this is limited to beings that have souls, of course, so human beings. Turing says, no, it's conceivable that a machine could do this too. And this is how we would know whether we could say the machine really thinks. Can we hold a conversation with it? This is operationalist test of intelligence based on verbal behavior. Another thing they seem to agree on is that uh, to be intelligent, one has to behave uh, as if you're not determined, you know, by the quote unquote disposition of your organs, right? Um, uh, Descartes says that even if we were to build a machine that, I don't know, could have a conversation, it would be very limited and inflexible, and it wouldn't be uh, able to reason universally the way that human beings do. Turing uh, addresses this worry later on in the paper, so we're not going to talk about it too much today, but we are touching upon some pretty interesting questions uh, to do with uh, free will and determinism and all of that stuff. So um, just very interesting to raise these comparisons here, I think. In any case, uh, this would make a great topic for an essay or a reading response. So, you know, keep that in mind as you're reading through this stuff. Uh, one thing that I should mention, of course, is that Turing is not as focused on the machinery of the body as Descartes was, right? Um, you know, Descartes talks a lot about the soul, but he also talks about uh, animals are as beasts machines and the human body is a machine as well. And although Turing was definitely a materialist and definitely an atheist, um, probably due to the tragic passing of his very close friend, Christopher Morecambe, uh, when Christopher and Turing were both young children, um, uh, it's, 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 it's acknowledged now by historians that Morecambe was Turing's first love and that his death from tuberculosis really affected his outlook on life and probably got him started down that materialist atheist road, right? But anyway, I digress. Uh, Turing was a materialist atheist thinker, but he's not really as focused on the machinery of the body as like Descartes and Lemaitre were, or even Hobbes for that matter. He's not interested in, um, you know, automata, for example. You know, Descartes talks about automata in uh, the discourses and in the meditations. Uh, but Descartes isn't, uh, or, or Turing, rather, isn't interested in that kind of thing. He's interested in the thinky parts, not the body parts, right? Turing even writes uh, on page 434, it is possible that at some uh, time this might be done, that is, creating a, a robot, I suppose, that's physically indistinguishable from a human. But, he says, even supposing this invention available, we should feel there was little point in trying to make a uh, thinking machine more human by dressing it up in such artificial flesh. Uh, instead, you know, Turing is focused on the, quote, intellectual capacities of man, not on the physical appearance so much. So um, this is reflected in the kinds of conversations that Turing thinks a computer would have to be able to have in order to pass the test, to pass the imitation game. So Turing focuses on machines that can hold conversations about things like chess and poetry and so forth. There's a little sample conversation here from pages uh, 434 and 435 of the kind of questions and answers that Turing envisions as part of the uh, game. So the questions are asked by the interrogator, and the answers are given by the machine or the human playing the game, right? So the interrogator might ask, please write me a sonnet on the subject of the fourth bridge. The uh, agent, whether computer or uh, human, could answer, count me out on this one. I could never write poetry. Uh, then the questioner could ask, 
Add 34,957 to 70,764. Here, the agent actually pauses for a few seconds. I mean, think about it. If you're a computer, you can do that calculation like that. Um, if the computer answered right away, it would give itself away as being a computer. So you pause for 30 seconds if you're a computer and give the answer, 105,621. Questioner then asks, do you play chess? The computer says, yes. Or, or it could be the human. We don't know yet, right? Um, questioner, I have my king at k1 and no other pieces. You have only a king at k6 and rook at r1. It's your move. What do you play? Again, pause for a few seconds. Rook to r8 for mate. Again, pause because... You know, computers are quite good at chess, and um, in the 1950s, uh, chess playing was um, one of the areas that um, artificial intelligence researchers were really excited about. Um, think about it. Chess is logical. There are, there are definite and circumscribed rules. It's easy to, you know, chess is a very algorithmic thing. Right? So it was the perfect thing to try to get computers to play. Um, so we'll probably talk more about playing chess as the course goes on. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is an example of the kind of flexible conversation that the machine, if it is a machine playing the game, has to do. It has to do it uh, in this kind of living voice kind of way. Flexible, non-deterministic, just like we seem to be able to do. This living voice, or Viva Voce, by the way, is a game uh, that used to be played. Uh, I think uh, teachers would play this game with students. Uh, students could perhaps play this game with one another. In any case, this game, Viva Voce, was designed to see whether, you know, had you learned something by rote, it was designed to see whether you really understood what you had learned, or whether you were just, you know, parroting the information back to the instructor. Uh, you know, so if I'm asking you questions about, I don't know, chess, for example, um, and I'm asking you in this way, perhaps what I'm trying to do is see if you really understand the game or whether you've just memorized the list of rules, right? That's what Viva Vake was for. And Turing adapts this and uses it for the imitation game. So, uh, all this is to say that although Alan Turing thinks uh, the question, can machines think, is a bit silly, and that it would be very, very difficult to try and define thinking, he does seem to have a few criteria in mind that any thinking thing, be it a human or a machine, has to be able to do. Um, it has to be able to reason, um, or to employ reason, in a domain-general way right, your human or your machine, if we're to say that it thinks, has to be able to use reason uh, in a lot of different areas, reason about a lot of different things, just like we do. It also needs the ability to express the results of that reasoning or the reasoning itself using language, right? And of course, finally, the human or the machine, if we're to say it thinks, also has to be able to do this originally or at least, you know, if not non-deterministically, at least it has to seem that way. You know, because if we're machines, we might be completely determined as well, right? But it doesn't seem that way. We use our uh, reason and language flexibly, um, ostensibly with some semblance of free will. Um, so you need that too. And that is something that Turing and Descartes uh, both seem to agree on. So these are the three criteria um, that Turing uses for his operationalist understanding of intelligence or thinking. Indeed, um, Stuart Schieber, uh, in his book about the Turing test, describes Turing's imitation game as a, quote, game-theoretic crystallization of Descartes' observation that flexibility of verbal behavior is the hallmark of humanness, right? We can think, we can show that we think and declare our thoughts to others using language, and we can do this flexibly and non-deterministically. At least that's the way it seems, 
right? So this is what a thinking thing has to be able to do. And if a thing can do that, in this case, a machine, then we are justified in saying that the machine thinks. That's what Turing has to say about thinking. He doesn't define it theoretically. Um, he operationalizes it in this way. I think this is a little bit ironic, though, because thanks to the development, uh, the developments that Turing made, um, we were able to develop, you know, along with the work of others like Hilary Putnam, uh, things like functionalism and the computational representational theory of mind. Um, if computation, if computationalism is true, then computation is thinking. Computation is what computers do, but it's also what the meat machine in our skulls does as well. Um, and if that's right, it's, it's kind of ironic because we don't need the Turing test to answer this question. We don't need this operationalist test if we have a theoretical definition of thinking, which we have thanks to computationalism, which would not be possible without Turing's earlier work on Turing machines and, and the like. I just think that's interesting. I don't know. Um, if you want to learn more about that, let me know. I'll hook you up with some interesting readings. Um, so that's what Turing has to say about thinking. Next, Turing will go on to talk about the kinds of machines that are going to play the imitation game. Um, again, he said it would be kind of silly to define thinking and define machine. We're going to end up going down these endless philosophical rabbit holes if we do that. Nonetheless, he does discuss digital computers and universal computing machines quite a bit in this paper. So let us talk a little bit about digital computers before we wrap things up for the day. All right, digital computers. Well, um, you're all familiar with the digital computers of today, your laptops and cell phones and desktops and whatnot. Um, but what Turing is talking about by digital computers uh, referred to uh, not just the early computers um, that he worked with, like the bomb or the Manchester machine, um, but also um, mathematical models like the Turing machine was, right? And I should mention, um, uh, Turing himself talks about this in his paper. Turing did not invent the first digital computer. Actually, um, the first digital computer was the analytical engine designed by Charles Babbage in the late 19th century. Babbage did not um, actually complete his analytical engine, but had he done so, it would have been the world's first digital computers, and it would have uh, run on, um, you know, punch cards and this kind of thing, the way that other early computers did. Anyway, recall from Lecture 1.2, if you will, uh, what we talked about when we talked about computation. Um, we learned there that one of the things that Turing is famous for is formalizing the notions of computation, and the algorithm. He did this um, while he was developing uh, his mathematical model, which would come to be known as the Turing machine, right? <clears throat> so, back to basics. Just what is computation? According to Jose Luis Bermudez, computation is what computers do. And according to many cognitive scientists, it is what minds do. So, this laptop, this meat machine in my skull, if computationalism, computationalism is correct, they're both computers. They both think, as I mentioned a moment ago. So that's what computation is, but what, what is it exactly? Okay, computation is thinking. That's not really an explanation of what it is. But what is it? Well, Turing provided an answer to that. Um, Turing provided the answer to that, in fact, and he did this while he was trying to address the halting problem or decision problem. The decision problem is, is there a procedure for determining whether a mathematical problem has a solution? Now, um, Turing wanted to address this, and he did this in his uh, paper on computable numbers. Um, Turing thought of computation specifically as a mechanical procedure. Uh, in fact, you, you may be interested to know that before the advent of digital computers, and well, technically even after the, ad, after the advent of digital computers, 
um, if you're talking about Babbage's analytical engine, computer was not a machine. Computer was a job description. Computers were human beings, and they had lists of instructions, and they had to compute figures. You know, this was all done by hand, uh, arithmetic, pencil and paper, and uh, slide rule calculators and whatnot. This is what humans computer, uh, human computers did, and they weren't allowed to deviate from their instructions in any way, right? It was all rule-governed step-by-step, you know, add these numbers, divide by this, and blah, blah, blah. You, you know how it is. You've done math before. So that was a human computer's job. Um, that, that's where Turing kind of gets his mechanical notion of computation from, and he had to make it more precise. Uh, you know, yeah, human computers have to follow their instructions, but, you know, can we make this more precise? Yes, we can. Turing did this by appealing to the notion of the algorithm. Algorithms are quite old, right? Algorithms go all the way back to Al-Khwarizmi, who was a scientist and philosopher who lived during the Islamic Golden Age. So this is hundreds and hundreds of years ago that we've had algorithms. Turing uh, kind of modernized the concept. Um, he talks about algorithms as sort of unambiguous sets of rules that can be applied to objects or sets of objects in a definite and circumscribed way. More specifically, to transform that object or set of objects in a definite and circumscribed way. So how is computation mechanical? It's mechanical in the sense that it's algorithmic. Computation basically involves taking you know, some input or set of inputs uh, and transforming them algorithmically into outputs. What those inputs and outputs are depend on your program and what it's defined for, right? And of course, that's what solving the halting problem was all about. An answer to the halting problem would tell us whether a computer program is defined for some inputs and not others. It would tell us whether uh, the computer program would arrive at a solution or if it would just you know, loop indefinitely, uh, trying to find an answer that it will never discover, right? So, um, in in his efforts to formalize all of this and, and to solve the halting problem, or provide an answer to the halting problem, Turing conceived of a kind of imaginary machine that we now call, in his honor, a Turing machine. Um, I talked about this in Lecture 1.2, but, you know, again, remember, a Turing machine is an imaginary machine, or an abstract mathematical machine. It's not like a literal machine. If we were to build one, it might look something like this, right? It would have an infinitely long tape with cells on it, so that we don't have any worries about storage. And on these cells, we can write symbols. The symbols represent information. Uh, Turing, in his paper, uh, talks about uh, the numbers 0 through 9. Those are the symbols that he uses. Of course, nowadays, we only use 1s and zeros. We only use binary. Uh, but Turing uh, used a uh, uh, different kind of machine code back in the day, pre-binary. Anyway, um, we can write symbols onto our tape in the cells of the tape with the machine head. Uh, the machine head can also move the tape, one cell to the left or right. It can also uh, delete cells, type in new symbols, so on and so forth. We've got a display window that displays the state of the machine. And we have a machine table, or what we would call the computer program today. This contains all the instructions for the machine and so forth, right? Now, um, a Turing machine's behavior is determined by the machine's current state, its machine table, the symbols on the tape, and so forth, right? The Turing machine is completely determined by all of this, right? So if we had the computational resources, we could predict exactly what it's going to do. Um, Turing actually draws a comparison between digital computers uh, and Laplace's demon in his paper, right? Uh, Laplace's demon has godlike knowledge such that if it knew uh, the initial conditions of the universe or some conditions at some point in time in the universe, it could predict with a complete accuracy what the universe would be like sometime later, right? Same thing with these machines. They're completely determined. Um, so these Turing machines gave Alan Turing 
uh, the mechanistic account of computation and the algorithm that he needed to address the decision problem. Turing, by the way, calls these uh, discrete state machines. You know, they're completely determined and they can only be in one state at a time, although they are, you know, there are many possible states that the machine could be in. This is, by the way, what makes them digital. They're discrete state machines. They're digital, right? The machine state could be represented in uh, one point in time by the numbers one, two, three, four, five, for example. Um, at another point in time, maybe the state of the machine is 79462, right? But the point is, it's in one state, and that's what makes it digital. It's this or it's that, you know, it's on or off, it's zero or one. This is the difference between digital representation and analog representation, right? Digital representations are discrete, analog representations are continuous, right? Think about the difference between an MP3 file and a vinyl record. An MP3 file is really just a bunch of ones and zeros. That information is digital. But uh, on a vinyl record, um, the little notches on the record that the needle makes contact with, which produces the sound, those are continuous. So that's the difference between digital and analog. Discrete versus continuous, okay? Now, the important thing about Turing machines, as I said in lecture 1.2, is that uh, their machines, uh, the, the, the states of these machines can be represented as sequences of numbers. And because of that, Turing was able to generate mathematical proofs about the properties of Turing machines. And he proved that there exists a universal Turing machine, a uh, universal computer, basically, that could run any specialized Turing machine. And that's basically the theoretical precursor to this. You know, in, in computing machinery intelligence, uh, he just calls these digital computers or universal computers, but we call the theoretical versions of these Turing machines now in Alan Turing's honor. He also proved that there's no solution to the decision problem. Um, specifically, the decision problem is not decidable, algorithmically speaking. You know, we can't decide uh, we can't express algorithmically, um, you know, the answer to whether a Turing machine will run forever or arrive at a solution. It's not decidable. But anyway, um, Turing's work, along with that of Alonzo Church, his doctoral supervisor, uh, did show that any mathematical problem that can be solved algorithmically can also be solved by a Turing machine. So any mathematical problem that can be expressed algorithmically is decidable. The halting problem is not that kind of thing. That's essentially what Turing proved. As we saw in our previous lecture on this, Turing's work provided the basis for understanding cognition, that is thinking, as computation, that is transforming representations according to rules or transforming inputs into outputs. And these are, you know, the inputs are information that is represented somehow into an output, right? Um, this is, if computationalism is correct, this is what our minds do as well, okay? Our minds are also computers, which is why I think it's kind of funny that uh, I guess Turing devotes... Um, uh, so much discussion to this imitation game. The imitation game is fascinating, but is it necessary to answer the question, can machines think? I personally don't think so, and this is one of the things I argued in my PhD thesis, actually. So if you're interested in taking a look, let me know. Um, sorry for the self-plug there, but, you know, you, you got to promote yourself. This is not to say that I don't think Turing tests are important. I do think they're important. I just don't think they're strictly necessary for answering this question, can machines think? We, if, you're, if you're a computationalist, you already agree. Yes, machines can think, computers think, because they compute. And our minds are like natural computers, so they compute too. So no problem, no need for a Turing test. But we might still want the Turing test if we wanted to see whether a particular machine is capable of thinking, or perhaps even as an experimental apparatus to use machines to learn uh, more about how we think about thinking machines, which was really what my PhD work was about. 
Anyway, I digress. So uh, there you have it. Those are the kinds of machines that Alan Turing would have play the imitation game. Basically, universal digital computers. Um, and he's asking, you know, on the one hand, as a sort of thought experiment, is it conceivable that one of these computers suitably programmed could play the imitation game well? And of course, he thinks the answer is yes. So as far as our thought experiment version of the Turing test goes, yes, there are imaginable digital computers that could pass the Turing test. On the other hand, uh, it's also an operationalist test of intelligence. And Turing himself thought that uh, in a number of years, there would be machines that exist which could do well at the imitation game. Um, this is the idea behind the uh, Lubner Prize, for example. The Lubner Prize offers uh, prizes to people who can program uh, really good uh, chatbots, basically, to see if they can pass the Turing test. No one has yet claimed the grand prize, uh, but then again, the Lubner Prize is a little bit silly, if you ask me. So, um, but anyway, uh, that's the story. Are there digital computers, real or imaginary, that could do well at the imitation game? That is what Turing is asking. This is how he replaces his question, can machines think? So, that's it for today. All right, so what have we done? Well. Um, in a weird, long, meandering kind of way, we've actually covered sections 1 to 5 of Turing's paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. What I would like to do next time is explore some of the objections to Turing's uh, ideas that he raises and then responds to in his paper. And this is largely found in section 6. So that's what we'll be starting with next time. We'll talk about some of these objections in a little more detail than others, but they're all very interesting and they all bear on some very fundamental philosophical questions to do with the nature of the human being, of thought, of free will, and so on. So it will be uh, very interesting, I'm sure. And if there's anything you want to know about the Turing test or Alan Turing that I haven't covered in today's lecture, uh, please let me know. Ask me on Discord, uh, discussion forums, YouTube comment section. Alan Turing's work is my jam. It is kind of my speciality. And I would love to talk about his work more if you guys are interested in that. So if you've got any extra questions, uh, please do let me know. It would be great to tackle them with you. Otherwise, um, I'll see you all next time. Um, yeah, that's all for today. All right. Bye for now.